So in the last video, we talked about aposomatic coloration, which is warning coloration, and how sometimes animals will actually mimic the others that have this coloration. And that process we call several different types. The, the Bateson type of mimicry is when an animal that's harmless copies an animal that is harmful. So it mimics the model which is worse than him so that it will gain the same advantages that the message of the harmful one is sending. There's also Mullerian mimicry when two harmful mimic each other so that they together advertise the danger of their colors. And those two will be the two most important ones you definitely have to know. And then we also talked about that sometimes when a harmful species actually mimics something that's less harmful to truly gain the most advantage because they might be too harmful and so they, are, they will not be teaching the message successfully so it's easier to them to model something that is a slightly less harmful than them and then we call that Mertesian mimicry. And then we also talk about cryptic coloration is which is when animals will change the coloration pattern to either defensively or offensively work within their environments to hide within the environment so that they not be detected by the predators or as that predators can elude detection by the prey and attack the prey. Uh, and so it, these are both kinds of really cool types of mimicry. Now there's some other kinds of mimicry that show up in nature and in these ones we're actually going to talk about some of the plant types of mimicry as, some, as well as some of the advanced animals kind of mimicry. Now now on this example of what we call Wasmanian mimicry, the inquiline, which is something that's living inside of, of another colony of animals or another species, tries to mimic that species and that's what called the inquiline mimics the model. So what it's actually trying to do here is trying to mimic the look of termites or several termites put together. When you look at a colony of termites, this particular animal here will almost disappear within the colony. So it will live in a colony of termites, kind of, uh, kind of mixing yourself up with the termites, eating the foods the termites eat, and even avoiding attack by predators because the poisonous termites will, or, and all those soldier termites will attack any kind of predator that comes to it. So in that sense, they will, he will receive protection from mimicking the termites and living inside of them. And that's an example of what we call a parasitic relationship, but this mimic is doing a really good job at doing that. And that's, again, when the inquiline, which is the one that lives in the colony, will actually try to mimic the models of that colony. And it doesn't do a perfect job in this case, but it does a really good job. And if you actually try to spot this in the middle of a bunch of termites, you probably would never find it. Another interesting thing that is along, along, along with the same concept is what we call it the Vavilovian uh, mimicry. And this is actually kind of what we call weed mimicry. And a lot of plants have what we call vegetative mimicry when they actually end up looking like each other. Now in this field here, although you might not be able to tell apart, there is actually two types of plants. One is the crop that the, the farmer is actually trying to plant. And the other one is a weed that's actually very, very bad and it's actually going to be growing very fast and competing with the crop that the farmer actually wants for the resources the farmer actually is trying to invest in growing the crops. Now the only, not only that, the farmer is going to have to waste resources separating the two of them afterwards and it's also going to have to uh, deal with the fact that it's going to lose yield because of the crop that's invading this. So the idea here is that the weed is growing to actually look like the crop and therefore it will be very hard for the farmers to differentiate between the weed and the actual crop. Of course this is a combination of the effects of natural selection and artificial selection. Artificial selection is pressure from the humans which are trying to make them disappear and inadvertently causing the reverse effect of actually making them look more and more like the crop. And also natural selection because there's clearly an advantage of looking like the crop in this case because it's kind of like the whole idea of bitches and mimicry. Uh, when they copy the crop, they get the benefits that the crop gets. You know, the crop gets the care that the humans give them. They protect them from predators. They give them the resources that they need to survive, water, nutrients, and everything. And so there's clearly an advantage of looking like the crop. So together, that has led to the pressure that made the weed actually developed the same, really the same way that the crop developed. Now the cool thing about this is of course when the farmer tries to delete or kill the crops which look um, like the weeds, they actually end up causing the weed to end up looking more like the crop because all the, the ones which they don't catch are the ones which are going to be surviving. So they're un inadvertently causing artificial selection towards the look that is very very similar to the real crop. And so 
inadvertently they make the situation worse. It just watch is really weird because they're trying to get rid of the crop, but in fact they're actually making the crop become more common uh, by selecting against the ones which are, they can actually discern and leaving behind only the ones which are almost identical to the crops that they actually try to keep. Likewise, if they use pesticides to kill the weeds, it will kill the weeds which are not resistant to the pesticide. And usually they will use the pesticide that will kill only the weeds, but not the crops that they want. But then what ends up happening is they develop uh, crops which will have resistance to the pesticide and will have the same kind of effect that you would have on the crop. No effect. And therefore, the weeds will end up becoming just like the crop, looking just like them, and just like the crop, they will be resistant to the pesticide that you try to use. So this kind of mimicry is very, very interesting, and that's why, for example, here with rye and wheat, they will both be in the field and cause problems for farming. Now, another one interesting type of this is what we call Gilbertian mimicry. Now, Gilbertian mimicry is when a plant actually will mimic its parasite in order to avoid being attacked by the parasite. So the whole idea here is that a certain kind of plant is attacked constantly by a caterpillar. Now, the, in order be, to, to do a, not be attacked by herbivores, this plant actually develops toxicity so that the, the herbivores will actually eat them and then just like the apostomatic coloration, they will avoid them and learn to avoid them next time because they don't taste very well. But a special group of caterpillars develop an enzyme that can actually eat through that poison and they will be fine. So they did this because the pressure existed for, for any animal that could possibly eat this plant to survive better because there is no competition basically. They could eat this plant by themselves since the other herbivores would be avoiding them. And so they evolved a way to avoid that. Now then, in response to that, in what we call coevolution, this plant evolved a system to mimic the eggs of the caterpillar. Because you see, when the caterpillar is at the butterfly stage, it will actually lay down the eggs on the plant so that when the eggs hatch, it will be already in the leaf that it, they need to eat and therefore it will be more likely for them to survive. But if they see there's already a lot of eggs sitting on the leaf, they're going to avoid laying eggs on that leaf because they will be more competition for the offspring. And so they will go first to leaves which don't have eggs. So some plants develop the capability of producing in their leaves what looks like the eggs of caterpillars so that they will, uh, caterpillars will avoid laying eggs there. And this is an example of where the host is mimicking the parasite. Another interesting kind of mimicry is something that we call auto-mimicry and also called Browerian mimicry after the scientists that discovered it. But the idea here is that some caterpillars will have hypostomatic coloration to let the animals know that they are toxic. But you see, they are not born with this pattern. They develop this pattern after they eat the toxic plants like the plants we just described. They will live in a plant and by eating the toxic plant, they become toxic themselves, which is yet another reason why they develop the system of, of living on these plants because they actually get that advantage. And the more of these plants that they eat throughout their life, the more the coloration would jump out. And so that means that some caterpillars will have very, very, very beautiful and bright coloration patterns because they ate a lot of the toxic plant. Other caterpillars, though, will not have this advantage because they were not born in places that they actually have uh, the, the toxic plants. And so what they're trying to do here is mimic caterpillars of their same species, which look like that because they ate the diet. And this is called auto-mimicry then. They will look like the ones that ate the diet. In other words, they will have innate coloration patterns that will look as if they actually ate the poison, even though they didn't eat the poison. So they're kind of like mimicking each other. Um, in that sense, they're mimicking their members of their own species, members which have the coloration of toxicity because they actually uh, ate the poison. And so throughout that, over time, the caterpillar gets more and more bright because it will already start bright and then get even more bright if it actually eats the poison. But there's also selective advantage to actually have the coloration of one that looks as if it ate even though it didn't. And throughout this process, the caterpillar mimics itself and becomes brighter and brighter over the generations. That's the idea of auto-mimicry, when they copy it themselves and put pressure on themselves to change the coloration pattern. Another interesting kind of mimicry is what we call aggressive mimicry. And in this kind of mimicry, the predators will actually look inviting so that the prey will come up close to them and then when the prey is on them or close to them, they will actually attack and eat them. And examples of that, you see here this bug that actually kind of mechs himself with the environment and it will look like a leaf. The prey will actually come by, they will have to eat the leaf and it will end up being eaten by the predator. So it's like the predator is duping the prey into coming closer 
or actually looking so close to the environment that it will actually camouflage itself with the environment, which actually gives them a defensive, defensive advantage as well, since the, it will be hard for predators that eat this predator to actually uh, spot them. And another example is that fish that has the light bulb fish from Fighting Nemo, and the, the, they have, that attracts the fish to the, to the color that he produces with bi, uh, uh, biofluorescence, and then when the fish comes close, he will, of course, attack them and try to eat them. And there's also parasites which you do this, and we call this parasite mimicry. And when is when parasites will copy the look of the prey that, of the host that they want to get into. So basically, this example here, you see that the they have these parasites will try to mimic the prey of birds, the worms that the birds I would like to eat. And then what ends up happening is that the birds will eat them, and then the parasite will go inside of them, and you know. Uh, pretty much take over and so that's just kind of like aggressive mimicry is either uh, luring the prey or duping the prey into believing that it's the predator is not there or it's not a predator at all and then the predator can either call the prey closer to itself or come closer to the prey uh, with those methods and sometimes they also serve the purpose of camouflage at the same time to the environment Another very cool type of mimicry is what we call bakery and mimicry, and this is what we call fake flowers. Now, sometimes flowers, of course, will attract pollinators because they have nectar, which uh, the pollinator will, will come to get, and then uh, ends up the pollen ends up getting stuck to the pollinator, like bees and some birds that feed on the nectar, and then they will fly to a different plant and end up uh, transferring the pollen. And that's an advantage of flowering plants that really made them explode in the environment. But what would happen if I make a fake flower, a flower that doesn't really have nectar, but it looks like a flower that has nectar? It may dupe the actual pollinators to come to try to find the nectar, and that's what we call fake flowers. When the flowers make a fake female flower or male flower that may have the nectar, and then uh, will actually call the uh, things to actually t come towards it, and then and finding out that there's none. But by the time they found out that there's no nectar, it's too late. They already have pollen all over them, and the plant uh, succeeded in its mission. Another interesting kind of mimicry that you see here in the top left, it's called pseudocopulation, and that's when a flower fakes the mate of some other species to attract the pollinators to actually try to copulate and inadvertently you know they don't know of course that it's not the female that they're trying to copulate with it's just a flower but they get full, filled with pollen and pollen gets stuck to them and then when they go to another flower and get duped again they transfer the pollen from flower to flower and that's called pseudo copulation when a flower makes itself look like a bird or, or a bug of another species so to attract uh, pollinators not by nectar by but by um, Thinking, making them think that they're the female of the species. So you see that flowers will attract pollinators with a lot of things, with colors, with shapes, with uh, nectar, with uh, smell, and all, all the things. And that's why um, it gets very, very advanced. Another one interesting kind is called intersexual mimicry, and it's when organisms of the same uh, species uh, mimic the opposite gender to dupe the males or females into thinking that there that there are actually of the opposite gender. So, for example, you have a bug that or pill bug you see that they, he will make themselves look like the female, so that the males of the species will try to copulate with him and then waste their reproductive efforts on that part. And so, this is a really good way to to uh, reduce competition for females. Um, basically, you attract the males to to copulate with you. And so they will waste the effort um, of doing that. And so that's actually a very interesting way. You see how the male over here, it's making itself look just like the female. And it's almost indistinguishable. And so it's going to be very, very hard from the other males to actually differentiate between the real female and the male that's making itself look like the female. And so this was called uh, intersexual mimicry, or um, it, it happens within the same species. And there's also other kinds of mimicry that we call body part mimicry. You see here... Um, how this particular butterfly or, or moth is making itself look like the eye of an owl or a hawk. And so this eye spot will dissuade uh, the smaller birds from attacking this because it makes itself look like it's an owl. And you wouldn't want to come close to an owl and you would risk being eaten by the owl because it's such a top predator in the ecosystem. And so that way, you actually it's a defensive mimicry that's actually making, pushing people away. And flowers will sometimes do this as well. And of course, you have flowers which will be aggressive and have mimicry that will attract and dupe the, the prey into attaching themselves to it and all of these kinds of things. And there's also other kinds of mimicry that I haven't even described, including things like auditory mimicry, behavior mimicry, and constructive mimicry where animals build structures to mimic other the structures of other animals 
animals. A behavioral mimic, of course, they act like other animals to kind of dupe the um, other animals. And they also, auditory mimicry, when they make themselves sound like the other animals. So these are all different kinds of mimicry, and I hope you learned a lot and you found this interesting. That's one of the coolest things in biology. See you guys in the next video.